Welcome to worship for October 18th, 2020. My name is John Hagman, senior pastor at First Presbyterian Church here in beautiful Morganton, North Carolina. We are in our new fall series titled Pivot, Enemies of Gratitude. We have learned that nostalgia for the past can be an enemy of gratitude in the present and can hold us back from striving toward our future. We've learned that letting go of worry is not a matter of ignoring what's wrong, it's a confidence in what is right. We can let go of worry because we know God is near. We've also learned that we can pivot from entitlement and toward gratitude when we remember how awesome God is and how truly amazing God's gift of grace is. This week we'll learn how greed can keep us from living grateful lives. Friends, this season has been tough. Our world has been impacted in incredibly deep ways in 2020. Anxiety, fear, and anger have become our baseline emotions. Joy and gratitude seem like distant memories, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uncertainty about the present, let alone the future, has caused many institutions to change course or to pivot. It's a new buzzword to describe how some have adjusted while others keep plotting away, hoping for a return to normal. My hope is that this series will help us identify ways of thinking that are detrimental to gratitude. My prayer is that through our study of scripture, that you and I will be equipped to move away from those and instead position ourselves to live lives of gratitude. Sometimes that's easier said than done. But despite our circumstances and despite how we feel, followers of Jesus are called to live in grateful response to what God through Christ has done. It's not fake or manufactured happiness. It's a joy from knowing who we are and whose we are. I pray you'll be blessed today. Church, let's be called into worship. In 1789, Benjamin Franklin wrote a letter to John Baptiste Leroy that contained a quip that has endured to this day. He wrote, Our new constitution is now established and has an appearance that promises permanency. But in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Taxation without representation was a major influence of the American Revolution. The colonists resisted paying taxes to the British government because they had no say in the process. And so, rebellion took place. Taxes are still a big issue today. As we barrel into a national election, the issue of taxes has been swirling. Who pays taxes and who doesn't? How much or how little do they pay? Is everyone paying their fair share? If so-and-so wins, will the tax code look different or not? On and on and on. Well, our scripture for today deals with the issue of taxes. Jews in Jerusalem were occupied by a foreign power, the foreign power, the Roman Empire. Jews were allowed to worship in the temple but were taxed unfairly to support the Roman Empire and the Roman war machine. The Romans paid tax collectors to acquire the funds. The tax collectors were paid a wage but could also keep any overage charges that they charged and they did. Many had the reputation for living lavishly while others struggled to survive, let alone pay. Tax collectors were despised for this. Despite paying the tax, the Jewish population had few rights because they were not viewed as truly being Roman citizens. Interestingly, this account comes to us from Matthew's Gospel. And do you recall who Matthew was? Before Jesus called him to be his disciple, Matthew was a tax collector. So hear God's word from Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
So a little social background of this first century scene is helpful as we dive in to what is actually going on here and what Jesus is actually teaching. Josephus, a first century Romano Jewish historian, observed and recorded that there were distinct groups within Judaism at this time. First, there were the Essenes, who were an exclusive group of folks who were super strict and believed the temple was corrupt. They removed themselves from worship and society. They were devoted to study and became nearly monastic. The Pharisees were the largest, most influential, and popular group. They were involved in government, community, and religious practices. They focused on both the oral and written law and table fellowship. When you and I think about Jewish practice and belief in the Bible, this is most likely the group that the majority of us think about. Next, we have the Sadducees, who consisted of priestly, aristocratic, and military circles. Sadducees were often accused of pursuing wealth and higher social status. My undergrad religion professor, he likes to remind us of these folks by saying this, they denied resurrection and the existence of the afterlife, so they were sad, you see. <laughs> Terrible Bible joke, but it helps. They rejected the oral law and focused instead on temple worship. Zealots were passionate about liberty. They believed that they must act on God's behalf or the Lord would punish the in entire nation of Israel. Zealots looked to incite an uprising of the people to expel the Romans from the Holy Land. And so our passage from today, Matthew shows the Pharisees have decided to kill Jesus and are seeking to trap him by asking him to teach on controversial topics. Matthew shows this happening three times in succession, starting with this question today about taxation, then on resurrection, which would get the Sadducees all riled up, and then finally, about the greatest commandment in Hebrew scriptures. Ironically, Jesus affirms the position of the Pharisees all three times, despite their intent to discredit and to kill him. Matthew also mentions Herodians. Herodians were a political party of Jews who were way more Hellenistic and benefited quite nicely from Roman rule. They wanted to keep the dynasty of Herod the Great on the throne in Judea. Needless to say, the Herodians didn't exactly get along well with any of the other groups. So why is all this important? Well, Matthew says the Herodians and the Pharisees are the ones who come to Jesus. These two groups would have been a really weird mix. They're unlikely allies. This is the embodiment of the classic adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. If Jesus says that it is unlawful to pay taxes, as the Pharisees thought but would never teach publicly, then the Herodians and the Romans would see him as an instigator. But if Jesus says that it's okay to pay the tax, then the Pharisees would see him as anti-Torah, and the Zealots would lose their minds and start stoning him for going against God's word. Jesus sees through their malice and their trap. Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? The word in the original language is a word used in the theater for actors. Hupokrites one who wears a mask, one who pretends to be something they're not. So after calling them hypocrites to their face, Jesus asks for a coin. But why would he do that? Because for the Jews, the Roman coin itself was a problem. The Jews believed that graven images were appalling to God. You may recall they got into some trouble back in the wilderness for making a golden calf. Now the only acceptable currency to pay the Roman tax was Roman coin. The conversation with the Herodians and the Pharisees takes place in the temple area, a holy place, a place of worship, sacred ground for the Jewish faithful. Here, in this holy place, devoted to the worship of the God of Israel, Jesus asks for a coin. But he doesn't have one. Who does? The Pharisees, the Herodians, the Jewish faithful. Jesus takes the coin and asks, whose face is on the coin? In Greek, the word is icon whose icon is on this coin. The denarius was the most common coin and was stamped with the image of Emperor Tiberius. It was inscribed with words that read Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus, high priest. So here, in the temple area, on holy ground, faithful Jews pull out a Roman coin that was engraved with an image of a Roman emperor and proclaim the divinity of Caesar. This would have been way more than hypocrisy, it's blasphemy. 
They acknowledge their participation in the economic system made possible by Rome, even having Roman coins in the temple area. Jesus wisely responds, pay back to Caesar what is Caesar's and pay back to God what is God's. I've heard this preached in a way that interprets this passage as a biblical reasoning for the separation of church and state. But I don't think that's what Jesus has in mind at all. Jesus not only avoids the trap set for him, but he reframes the question. The question is not about taxes or money. The question is about what belongs to God. But giving back to God what is God's is hard. We like to hold on to things. We grab with greedy hands and hoard things. You and I reserve things for ourselves. You and I like things that are ours, things that we own. It's kind of satisfying to say, it's mine, I earned it. That is, after all, the American dream, earning dollars and owning things. Greed makes life all about you and what belongs to you. But at the heart of the scriptures is this assertion that God has authority over all the earth. God owns everything and entrusts us, you and me, to be stewards of it. Everything we have and all that we are is a gift. The appropriate response is gratitude. We look after things and take care of God's gifts and offer them back to God because after all, it's all God's anyway. Stewardship is about asking what belongs to God and placing it with gratitude back into God's hands. Knowing and living like it's all God's anyway takes tremendous faith. It takes an attitude of gratitude and an awareness and recognition of all the blessings God has bestowed. Too often though, you and me, we cling too tightly to things. The stuff we've been asked to steward can easily become an idol. Pretty soon we can succumb to our greed and avarice. We like power. We like owning things. We like our status and meaning and value in our stuff. We find our status and meaning and value in our stuff. Our bank accounts, our retirement plans, our technology, our time, and our gifts. We withhold rather than share. We are not generous with what is ours. We keep things for ourselves. You and I can believe the lie that if I just had that thing, or drove that car, or if I just had that job, or if I just had that relationship, or if I just wore those clothes, or if I just had this much money in my bank account, or if I just felt younger, stronger, better looking, a better leader, whatever, that life would be good. Happiness and joy and contentment are always just out of reach. We pursue graven images. Unfortunately, friend, when we look to give people or things our allegiance and worship rather than God, that's called idolatry. Ted Wardlaw is the president of Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary. He puts it simply, we belong not to our possessions, but to God. Christians may have to pay the emperor the tax, but that does not mean a neat division of loyalties that ends up giving Caesar far more than is due. So the questions for you become, who is your emperor? Whose image is engraved on your life? What do you think you owe that person or thing? Where do your loyalties lie? Again, Ted Wardlaw warns, do not give the emperor your faith. Do not give the emperor your ultimate allegiance. Do not forge a relationship with the emperor that forces you to figure out how God can rightly fit into the emperor's pocket. But there's good news, friends. We can pivot away from idolatry and greed. By remembering that we are made in the image of God and now bear God's image, remembering that we are bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, remembering that God is sovereign over all creation and that everything is the Lord's, we can live our lives in grateful response for the tremendous gifts that God has given. Gratitude and generosity are the antidotes for idolatry and greed. When you wake up in the morning, make a short list of things you're grateful for. Take just a few seconds to give thanks to God for waking up, for the breath that fills your lungs, for the beauty of a fresh new day, for family and friends, whatever comes to mind. When you go to bed at night, give thanks for the things that happened that day, for the good things that God blessed you with, for the opportunities to learn and grow from. Everything can be a cause to pivot toward gratitude. When someone comes to mind in the middle of the day, reach out and let them know you're grateful for them. It's amazing what happens when you tell people you are thinking of them, that you're praying for them, and that you're grateful for them. We can remind each other when we see God at work, and we can point out God's image in each other. So imagine how you might show generosity this week. Who might you show generosity toward? 
Now, generosity does not always involve money, but sometimes it does. Who might you bless? Who might you reach out and connect with? Who can you bless with a phone call or a text message or an email or a Facebook message or slide into those DMs or whatever you kids are doing these days? How might you steward God's gifts to bless others? Where can you give of yourself? Where can you volunteer? Where can you make a donation? Again, gratitude and generosity are antidotes of idolatry and greed. And so may you know what belongs to whom. May you pivot from idolatry and greed toward gratitude and generosity. And in grateful response to our gracious God, may you live with a grateful heart, with open hands, ready to give generously because it's all God's anyway. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.